hour. Um, welcome everyone to teaching online and on campus courses concurrently long title. Um, this session is uh, is being recorded and uh, by the way, I'm Dina Menye. I'm with the Center for Extended Learning. Um, also hosting this webinar is Brianna Bennett and Mary Power from the Center for Teaching Excellence. And um, we have four instructors with us here today that will be sharing their experiences. From the uh, Department of Management Sciences, we have Peter Carr, who is a continuing lecturer. We have Umer Shaw, who is also a lecturer with the same department. Um, from the Conrad School of Entrepreneurship and Business, we have Chris Holt, who's the Associate Director of the MBET program. And then we also have from the Center for Extended Learning, my colleague, uh, Daniel Oprahwal. And Daniel is not only an online learning consultant with CEL, he is also uh, an instructor, a former instructor with the University of Toronto. Um, so what we'll, the way we'll run this session is we'll give each of the instructors uh, up to about 10 minutes to speak a bit about their experiences in um, delivering and designing um, held with courses. So courses that um, I guess officially we're saying that they are in-person synchronous courses held with um, uh, remote <laughs> synchronous courses. Um, so on-campus students and online students um, learning together uh, synchronously. Uh, and this is one of the options um, for the, the fall term. So without further ado, we'll get started. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we actually decided on an order. So I'm just going to to start with Chris, I guess, because Chris was the first one here. So Chris, if you wanted to take it away, feel sure. free. Sure, okay. All right, can you see that okay? Yes, so thanks. Great. Okay, great, all right. Um, so I'm the director of the uh, MBET program here at the Conrad School. And uh, it's very important for us to teach in person, right? I mean, entrepreneurship is essentially an experiential uh, kind of thing. And so um, we, we um, went out of our way last year to figure out some way of within health protocols teaching in person in both the full time and the part time program. However, uh, in the full time program, we have a number of international students who couldn't get visas and uh, at least in time to start the, the course. So we, we had 22 of 32 students in person when we began uh, last year. The rest were online and I'll, I'll talk about that. I use the word hybrid to, you know, I'm probably not using the word properly, but that's what I'm using to describe this concurrent synchronous uh, online offline experience. Then of course we got into the lockdown in January and everybody had to go online. And then we went back with more students now who had arrived uh, with visas, um, we went back to the hybrid and then of course back to the lockdown. In fact, this toggling back and forth was one of the big um, benefits of having our model the way it was that we could easily switch back and forth and come back the second we were allowed to. Uh, in the part time program, this is a weekend program, uh, we had about 80% of the students in, in person. Those that decided not to come in could also join uh, online and uh, view that way. And of course, at a certain point, we went all online and then we had the option to bring them back and, and gave them as individuals the option and um, many decided not to. So we didn't have form and, and went, went all online after that. So that's a quick sort of history. Uh, 11, 10 of our 11 courses were taught in this model. One of our courses, because of the instructors, uh, requirements, um, uh, risk profile essentially for COVID uh, was all online the whole year. Uh, so that's the history. Now, uh, what did it look like from a hardware and software uh, standpoint? Um, you know, there are some optional pieces of equipment, but essentially this is pretty doable. Uh, we had a the standard podium computer connected to the projection screens, as you know, you'd find in many places on campus. We had room speakers connected to the podium computer, of course. Again, all pretty standard, at least here in uh, engineering. Uh, the, we, had a uh, we had the option and began with a lapel mic for the instructor so their voice would be picked up for the offline uh, or the um, offsite uh, participants. Um, but it could be connected to either the speaker system in the room, which is what we have, or the computer itself, if that would then broadcast out the speakers uh, that are hooked up to the podium. 
We had a ceiling camera directed at the instructor, obviously, and we also had a large format, like a 70 inch uh, monitor on the floor in front of the instructor. I'll show you how we use that and some of the tips and tricks in a moment. Uh, now, optionally, we did have a second uh, ceiling camera. We could uh, use a laptop or even just a cell phone on a tripod to um, to broadcast at the students so that the offline student or the offsite students could see the onsite students, right? And, and you know the whole class at once. Um, that's optional. We also had multiple ceiling mics installed here at Conrad. That's a little more pricey, and those picked up the ambient sound from the room so that the, the students in the room could speak and the, um, the uh, students online could hear them speak without the instructor having to, for example, uh, repeat their question, right? And that was, uh, that was a great uh, benefit. And then finally, we also have, uh, and this is totally icing, I get it, but uh, a touchscreen on the podium that would allow the instructor then to annotate the slide on the podium for it to be broadcast on the projection screen behind them and online at the same time, which created that kind of the same feeling you would have in a traditional classroom with everybody uh, watching you at the uh, at the whiteboard, for example. Uh, now, the software. This may seem obvious now that we use Zoom uh, or Teams. I, I assume Teams would work in a similar way. I'm not really a Teams person. I'm like like Peter. I think we've done maybe more Zoom. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Zoom did provide us with all of the, the last summer. This was a big deal that we had discovered this. But uh, first of all, it's ubiquitous amongst the students. They could brought, uh, join from a remote device. There's no learning curve for faculty. It allowed them to toggle uh, to an online, 100% uh, online environment and back again. Um, importantly, it had dual screen capabilities so that we could uh, share one screen and not the other. I'll show you how that worked in a sec. Uh, so we can move like the Zoom panels to a separate screen and still have one screen with the content, much like what I'm looking at right now, for example, with my slides here and all the, the uh, mechanics on the other side. Um, you know, the, the best thing about both of these tools, Teams and, and Zoom, is that if you want to add more cameras to the classroom, it's very easy. You just stick a tripod and a cell phone and use the Wi-Fi signal to put cameras wherever you want to have them. In fact, all of the students could join the Zoom call uh, in the room as well. Uh, you know, you can share videos. It's a little slow on Zoom, as you probably know. Um, uh, if you share a YouTube video across uh, Zoom, a bit better at E7, but at, when I do it from home, it's a bit slow. Uh, and then, um, you know, we can move these Zoom images to the uh, second screen on the floor, as I mentioned. I'll show you a, a diagram in a second. Um, you know, we can integrate guest speakers easily. I've had some guest speakers from around the world address these students in the classroom with the guest speaker on the projection screen. So it's sort of a you know big brother Apple commercial type situation with a big uh, face on the screen, but everybody in the room can see and everybody offsite can see the guest speaker as well. And then in one case, we actually had a situation where the students were in, the instructor couldn't make it in uh, because they were concerned about uh, the, like pink eye, I think it was, which is a you know potentially a, a sign of, of COVID. It wasn't, but uh, they stayed home. And uh, the students were in the classroom watching the instructor on the screen. As long as somebody's there to set that up, uh, it works. Uh, it works fine that way too. So a lot of flexibility using this pretty ubiquitous uh, tool. So this is what the configuration looked like. We had, as I mentioned, a ceiling webcam facing the instructor, and another one optionally facing the audience, or just a cell phone on a podium. That's how we began. Uh, facing the audience. This gave the off-site students a chance to feel like they were part of the experience by seeing, you know, students put up their hand and, and so on and so forth. We also had these uh, speakers installed in the ceiling along with these mics so that they wouldn't cause interference, these echo canceling speakers and mics. That was a little, little pricier uh, custom job. Um, but most importantly, the green line around the podium screen is there to signify the screen sharing and zoom it's green. I see it's red here in, in Teams, um, and that's the primary screen. Uh, the secondary screen is this big floor monitor, which contained everybody's face who was offsite, uh, the Zoom chat box, and uh, the participant list, along with them putting up their hands. So the instructor could stand at the front of the room, look down and see everybody who was offsite. And then the remote student would see the slides and of course, all the rest of the Zoom stuff uh, of the other offsite people, where one of those offsite individuals is the is the the uh, actually that the students in the classroom as broadcast from the cell phone on the tripod if that makes any sense so um you know we, we already have most of these tools 
uh, it wasn't too hard to to execute. Um, some of the use cases, obviously, um, you know, the lecture was easy because the the um, well, first of all, our ceiling mics picked up the instructor as well as the student. Even if they had a lapel mic, they could lecture, obviously. But the discussion was where I think the magic really happened because um, these uh, ceiling mics and speakers were so good that it sounded it was actually easier to hear somebody speaking at you from Nigeria or Malaysia or New Zealand than it was somebody at the back of the room. You know, they really were that sensitive. It was like the voice of God that filled the room whenever they whenever they spoke. So um, they could interrupt you. Uh, there could be debates between students in the room and students around the world. Um, and it, nothing more exciting than hearing a debate occur between uh, Lagos, Nigeria, Germany and, and Dubai and Waterloo in real time uh, in crystal clear uh, audio. Uh, so, um, you know, we obviously use a lot of breakout groups in entrepreneurship. Um, we learned a lot about how to do that effectively. Um, you have two choices, essentially. Either everybody online is in one breakout group and everybody on site is in another breakout group or groups, or you can mix them up. I mean, obviously, the advantage of mixing them up is that the off-site students don't feel as isolated. Um, but uh, if there's a group meeting, then everybody on site needs to be on Zoom so the off site people can see their faces, uh, which is a little weird because you'd have like five people around a circle and uh, they'd all be talking to each other and the off site person would kind of be looking up at them as they as they interacted with each other. But, you know, it gave the off site students a feeling that they were part of the community. Um, if you do randomized breakout groups, you've got a, you know, there's a bit of fancy stick handling required there. Obviously, you know, I mentioned we had guest speakers uh, displayed on the projection screen. Um, you know, we've, we've used it a couple of times for like a speed dating pitch type of situation where we would have experts and then reassign them to rooms or give them the option to move themselves between rooms. And so a team would keep pitching and a new, uh, you know, shark from Shark's Tank would show up every five minutes. And so as long as you have somebody kind of managing the logistics there and telling people where to go, that works well. And then as I mentioned, you know, we did a lot of, uh, you know, YouTube broadcasting over, over Zoom. Key lessons, and this is my final slide, uh, key lessons, um, you know, for engaging with these offsite students. I mean, you really need to keep an eye on the floor monitor. I, I was often victim of this myself, where you get so caught up with the people in the room, you forget to look down and you see something maybe in the chat box or somebody putting up their hand, or you forget to canvas the offsite students. Uh, to do so, you'd have to look up at the ceiling camera and talk to them, uh, which feels a little awkward as well. So there are sort of, it, it, it feels unnatural to try to engage the offsite students, but uh, you know, if you make it a priority, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, too, too hard. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, actively uh, canvas them frequently and first uh, encourage offsite students to interrupt, to keep their video on so you can see who is there, of course. So if you call on them, there's not a, an awkward silence. In fact, this is maybe a good excuse to require them to keep their camera on. Everybody else's, you know, their cameras are on. You can see them. Uh, so why not the offsite students? Uh, and uh, now during a break, like the break in the class or the end of the class, everybody starts speaking and the ceiling mics picked up everybody. So you couldn't communicate one on one with an offsite student after the fact. Uh, you'd have to call them afterwards. Don't use a waiting room because if you're going to forget to look down and let people in the waiting room, you don't want to spend the first 10 minutes of the lecture checking to make sure there's no one in the waiting room and letting them in. Passcode is the way to go. And there's a few quirks with PowerPoint that you should be aware of as well. Um, uh, you know, about presenter mode and primary monitor. And I'm happy to, to uh, I think you'll have access to these slides. So um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have about that. So some key lessons gathered from the faculty and one of our faculty member really hit it home well by saying, be forgiving to yourself. Uh, if you, if you uh, it can feel like managing two classrooms and it can be difficult and draining what the students know when you are trying something new, ask for feedback as you go, consider this a learning journey uh, and um, they will be uh, much, sorry, much more forgiving uh, and sometimes have great ideas if you let them, uh, if you let them in. So uh, that is uh, our experience at the Conrad School and the Embed program. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. That was uh, especially that last slide. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, what we'll do is um, we'll just get, get through all of the presentations and then we will have some time for questions afterwards. Uh, but please feel free to add questions if you like into the chat if um, if that's helpful for you and, and we'll address them uh, at the end. How do I um, teams? Uh, I'm sorry, Chris. How do I? Oh, there it is. Stop sure. presenting. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there you go. OK, all right. Um, so um, Peter, would you like to go next? I'm just because I see your face up there. So. <laughs> uh, sure, I'll to... share my uh, screen and uh, and we'll get going. Okay. Uh, so this is my PowerPoint and uh, I should begin by saying that. Let me just maximize it on the screen. There we go. Uh, I should begin by saying that Dina was very helpful in the preparation for this in that uh, she asked for 10 minutes and she also asked for uh, specific questions should be to be answered. So uh, this presentation is very much answers to Dina's questions. Uh, and of course, if you have questions, if any of the rest of you have questions, I'll be happy to address those uh, later. Uh, so the first of Dina's questions was, what was the course code, the name, and the level of enrollment? And I should preface that by saying that uh, I have delivered my courses both online and in the classroom since 2011. Uh, I do it with all of my courses. Uh, part of the reason for this was that prior to 2011, I had worked on the online master's program from Management Sciences. Uh, I had a bit of experience with doing things online uh, and I thought there was the potential to use technology to put the courses online and make them accessible to students that way uh, and that this would be a benefit for the students. But I was also keen to understand how technology might be better used to improve the overall educational experience. So I'll talk a little bit about what happened in the actual classroom but I also want to talk about uh, the other ways that technology was used as part of the hybrid course. So the courses I'm talking about uh, are the ones that you can see here, uh, MSI 442, which focuses on the impact of technology on society, uh, technical entrepreneurship, uh, MSI 454, uh, and then uh, for the Conrad Center, operations and supply chain, and project management that are offered at a master's level. You'll see on the right hand side of this screen that uh, online students and classroom students are broken down. This was part of uh, Dina's question. Uh, people moved freely from one to the other. And so these numbers are uh, kind of an estimate of the average attendance in these forums. But typically at the beginning of the, of the uh, term, uh, many more people would, uh, would participate online. And then as we got from week four onwards, uh, many more would uh, decide to move to an online uh, or a recorded format. So rather than come to the classroom, some of them would watch the, uh, the online live session uh, but more of them would either watch the recording or uh, consume the content in another way. Uh, Dina's second question was about the equipment which I used. Uh, there was only one real piece of equipment that was beyond what was already in the classrooms that I used. So I used the Podium computer in the classroom uh, and I plugged a, a webcam into that. And, and that was really all that I did. The webcam was good for picking up my voice uh, and Adobe Connect, which was the tool that I used at that time, uh, uh, was able to capture everything that I was presenting inside the room. Uh, and of course, the camera also captured my image. Uh, that operated reasonably smoothly. I had to have technical support at the beginning uh, to overcome the restrictions on the Podium computer for the installation of the camera, uh, but that has since disappeared. Over the last few years, I haven't really needed that. The technology platforms that I've used for broadcasting uh, was simply Adobe Connect, uh, but I also use 
a range of other technologies which enables me to organize a course that works effectively online. Uh, and I'll show you how these technologies are applied in the next uh, slide. So there are two elements that I apply technology to. One is the uh, creation of content and the presentation of that content. And the second is uh, to the activity uh, which the students are engaged in uh, as part of the course. So uh, on this slide, you'll see the knowledge content uh, the first element in the top left, as you look at this, uh, is my Adobe Connect screen. I've now moved to WebEx, uh, but I thought I should concentrate on the way the course operated while we still had people in the classroom. And at that time, it was with Adobe Connect. Uh, now I'm using WebEx, and I anticipate I'll use that if we continue to use it at the university once we move back into the classroom. Uh, so uh, one uh, thing I should mention about Adobe Connect is that by presenting uh, in the classroom and displaying on the screen what was on my screen uh, as I used Adobe Connect with the students, it means that students who are remote can type their questions if they wish to or their discussion, uh, or they can speak and be heard through the speakers in the classroom as Chris has described. Uh, all of that worked very nicely and Adobe Connect also uh, you know, allowed the class to be recorded. Uh, if you move to the right of that, you'll see the impact of Information Systems on Society website. I have a website for each of the courses that I teach. They're created in WordPress. It's very easy to use. Uh, and allows uh, the content to be moved easily from one course to another. Uh, and at the same time, it retains access for students uh, to the material for courses after they finish the course. And I quite like that aspect. The other uh, uh, thing that creating the website does is it means people in other institutions or other professors can easily use the material and material from my courses gets used uh, in courses elsewhere from time to time. Next is Twitter. Uh, if you move in another square right, uh, that allows me to keep my courses up to date. I post to that uh, quite regularly, uh, items that are of relevance to the courses that I'm teaching at that time. Students know that's there and they can see these current items. On the bottom, you can see, first of all, a playlist from YouTube. Uh, I conduct interviews with people who are specialists in the subjects uh, that I'm uh, teaching uh, and share those with the students. And uh, some of those interviews are there. There's a playlist for each course, and uh, I think that enhances the student, uh, the content as, uh, uh, that, uh, as far as the students are concerned. And then finally, those in interviews I uh, transfer to a, an audio format uh, and uh, and upload those as a podcast uh, on SoundCloud, which allows students to listen to the interviews uh, and also sometimes to recordings of lectures uh, while they're doing things with headphones in, uh, exercise and stuff like that. The agenda for a typical session uh, is listed here. It's relatively generic, I think. Uh, the main purpose of the lecture session uh, is to review the work that students have been doing. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, review the lecture content, the knowledge content for that week of the course. Uh, and um, it says here, create agenda. I'm not sure what that's there for. Uh, but basically this is listed here in the items that you can see. Uh, one thing I'd emphasize is getting to the classroom and setting up early, making sure everything works. The 10 minute gap between one class finishing and another starting is uh, not ideal uh, as far as uh, teaching in uh, uh, online and classroom at the same time, because you do need a bit of time to get things ready. Uh, the student questions I take first, I try to make sure that the processes we're using in the course 
are very clear and that we clear up any confusion uh, that may exist uh, right at the start of a lecture. So we can remove the, any concerns that might exist about that and concentrate on what people should be doing. Course admin, making sure people are aware of assignments, providing feedback on things they've been doing, briefing them on things that are coming up, uh, and then introducing that week's subject knowledge. Uh, students, uh, as I have uh, consulted with them about this, uh, often prefer or usually prefer to consume the actual uh, subject content uh, in formats other than live presentation, uh, particularly the website for the course where there's an expanded version of the lecture. They can take their time to read through it. They can go back over things that they may not be so familiar with. Uh, that's become their preferred, for most of them, their preferred way to ingest the course content, if you like. The classroom uh, is uh, plays a more uh, supportive role to the activities that are being uh, undertaken in the course. Uh, just uh, uh, two things. Uh, this is Dina's next question. Uh, question five, the strategies for uh, uh, participation, questions and engagement. Uh, I'm, I've described a bit about what I do with Adobe Connect, but I just wanted to emphasize the course discussion forums in LEARN. Uh, I always have an area called Ask the Professor where everyone can ask questions and everybody can see the answers to those questions. Uh, and also an area called Coffee Shop, used more in some courses than others, but which allows students to uh, share any items that they wish to with each other uh, and, and, and have a discussion around you know, anything that they wish to. Uh, I mentioned that the course activities was an important part uh, of the design of the courses that I operate in this way. This slide illustrates some of the group activities that I have students engage in online. A lot of these things could easily be done just in a classroom, uh, but they also work extremely well online and we're able to take advantage online of the asynchronous uh, uh, capabilities that online environments have, which doesn't exist inside the classroom. So we can, uh, in case studies, for example, we can have very deep discussion about the issues in the case that may not happen as easily in the uh, limited time that we have in the classroom. But there are a number of examples here uh, in MSI 442. Uh, we have uh, debates about the impact that technology is having uh, on society. One of, the, one of the areas of discussion this term was about the impact technology is having on people's beliefs about vaccines, which was quite interesting. Uh, in our operations course, we have a number of case studies and simulations. Uh, in my course on entrepreneurship, we've created an online a business incubator where students share their ideas about the development of their own uh, businesses or their ideas for innovation within an existing business. Uh, and then we have the technology enabled education resource library. This is a group activity in my project management course where we've created over the last five years uh, a, an online library for, of resources for teachers uh, in Pakistan, uh, working with an NGO there. Uh, and, uh, and we're now updating that for a new national curriculum in Pakistan. Uh, this is uh, the uh, 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 Dina's sixth question, which learning activities worked and which didn't. Most collaborative activities worked really well online. It was possible to combine people in the classroom with people uh, uh, online in those group activities too. Uh, prompt feedback and responses to students using this model, I think is very important. I think the touch points as uh, they may be called are extremely important. When there is direct contact with students, whether physically or uh, whether in a uh, physical environment 
or in an online environment, uh, very important that that be a high quality interaction as far as the student is concerned, uh, because the rest of their interaction may be more remote. Uh, synchronous availability, being available to the students, having a synchronous component. Uh, I've been critical of uh, the uh, completely asynchronous nature of uh, some of the courses or a lot of the courses during lockdown. Uh, I think having a synchronous element is important. Uh, industry uh, involvement in the projects that we do, we've worked with people all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and, and the interviews have been able to be conducted remotely too, to bring that expert content into the courses. Makes the courses much more accessible for working students. My master's students with Conrad uh, are, uh, uh, seem to very much appreciate the ability to join remotely uh, because they're often working. Uh, what didn't work? Uh, very long live or recorded lectures really don't keep students' attention for long, uh, and uh, that's probably something that many of you already know. So I think those are, oh, advice for others. The final question from Dina. Uh, begin with the learning, not the technology. Really, obviously, what we're trying to do is to create good learning uh, and to exploit the capabilities that technology gives us for that. But I often see uh, people uh, saying, what can we do with this cool new technology, as opposed to what uh, is, uh, what can we do to create good learning? Preparation uh, in, in this environment, I think, is very important. Uh, having things very well orga organized, perhaps better than you would if you were simply walking into a classroom. I think there are lots of exciting possibilities for better education. Uh, and don't be afraid to uh, experiment. The final thing, uh, as you consider the student participation in, in a, a hybrid course, uh, thinking about the complexity of it from their point of view, uh, I think is very important. Okay, so that is uh, really everything that I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to it. Thanks very much, Peter. It's very helpful. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I'm getting some feedback. OK, um, OK, so let's let's move on to um, the next uh, presenter. U Umer, would you like to share your screen next? Uh, sure. So let me okay. just bear with me. No problem. All right. I hope that you can see something on the screen with the name hybrid teaching setups. Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. awesome. All right. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Amir. Uh, a lot of you probably know me, but uh, for somebody who doesn't know me, just want to give you a brief introduction. So, I've been teaching online since 2012, uh, again in management science department. I'm a lecturer there. So I also teach um, grad courses at um, uh, the MOT at distance program, and I also teach undergrad courses. Um, I teach STEM, I teach non-STEM courses, I teach very large undergrad courses, ranging up to 240 students, and I also teach uh, seminar courses, which are just 16 or 17 grad students, um, all online and also on campus. So in my interactions with all these technologies and the past year working with my colleagues on how to you know, make sure that they're not spending uh, twice the work in porting things online, now we are being asked to port everything back on campus and kind of uh, in a hybrid mode. Um, so I would like to just focus on some of the technologies which would enable you or perhaps some tricks that can help you not spending 1.5 times your, you know, already time that you're spending on teaching a course. So it shouldn't be 1.5 or two times the course that you're teaching. Uh, it should be just one time. Um, so I will just explain uh, my own personal experience, and that's based on my own courses. Uh, but I would try and give you some alternatives as well, because I know the audience is quite varied. Uh, one thing that I really want to stress on is that I also resonate with what Peter mentioned, that keep it simple. That's what I've been doing, and I think it works. 
Um, so in hybrid teaching setups, uh, what I've been doing, I just take my laptop, my MacBook Pro in the in the classroom. Uh, this is there to project my screen. I work with industry all the time. So I have presentations in my class and these courses are fully online. Uh, sometimes I do that for on-campus courses as well, where the industry partner is not located in Waterloo, or perhaps uh, they have a board, they want to come to the class, but they cannot physically, so they just join me uh, via um, WebEx or, or previously we were using Adobe Connect. Now I don't think we have the licenses to use it. So Zoom, WebEx, and Bongo, these are the three platforms that I go to. Um, why? Because they're integrated with Learn. Uh, Bongo is very easy to operate. It's already integrated inside your system, learning management system. WebEx is also supported by university. Um, Teams is also supported by university. And Zoom, I'm hearing, will be supported. Uh, but I think everybody or pretty much everybody has accounts on Zoom uh, these days. Now, I really want to talk about one little technical detail there, like when you're choosing which tool to use when you go back on campus. You probably have experience um, with the online setup, but it's important to keep in mind that WebEx, it can support up to 1000 students. So there's no problem, whatever your class size, it's gonna be okay. Um, however, uh, for example, Teams, I think it just supports up to 150. So that's why it's a no-no for me. My, for example, class is 240 students. So do check on these things. Um, if you don't know where to find this kind of information, I think Richard Lee in engineering or CDE, CEL has, they have tons of resources that you can go to and find out which tool works for you. So when you go in a classroom, um, in fact, what I do is I just use uh, my MacBook to project me and then I have my iPad. Um, I just log into uh, using that iPad into whatever system I'm using, for example, Zoom, WebEx, whatever. Um, so it would say Umer, and in brackets, it would say iPad. So that means that it's me, and I just give that iPad the right to host. And what that means is that I can now annotate, I can write, I can solve equations, I can uh, do things on the screen. Um, and I also, at the same time, project the screen uh, if I have to for the students who are in the class. If I don't want to do anything on the whiteboard, I just do everything virtually. Uh, but I know by talking to some of my colleagues in the department, uh, they some of them really want to go and write on the board. So if that is something that you want to do, you can also just have a set up something like this. So you can have a whiteboard and you can see that my laptop is facing the whiteboard. I would be standing in front of it. So the uh, roster would have the laptop sitting on it and uh, it would be projecting my screen or it would be projecting the whiteboard and I'm just writing on it. And my students are going to be who are not in the classroom can be or will be watching it remotely. So this is the second version of that setup, which is very simple, very easy to do. Um, I will make this uh, PDF available. Uh, Dina, probably you can then send it to others. There, there's a very nice link that you can also watch um, how to do a simple setup. Um, and also Chris mentioned that you can use your tripod with your iPhone or your any phone on it. Uh, I think that also works. I've done that and it works. Um, however, I want to stress on some items that I've found myself um, uh, troublesome when I you know, go in the classroom and try to project the whiteboard uh, rather than my, my uh, iPad screen only. So what are the do's and what are the don'ts? Um, I would say, let's start with the do's first. Ensure that a lecture streaming or recording before beginning. Now, this has actually been my experience. I've uh, forgotten to turn the recording on because I got very busy. Some students started talking to me beforehand and I just forgot about it. And somewhere like 20 minutes in, I realized that it's not been recorded. So then I had to go back to my office after the remainder of the session is recorded. I have to re-record the session for anybody who was not in the classroom. So it has happened to me. So I always make sure that it's uh, pre-recorded. The setting is such that the moment I start uh, working on it, uh, it would just automatically start recording. Now, what are the don'ts? Um, and I'll talk about the FPA. This is a uh, frame per, uh, what is it? As per second or something along those lines, but it's basically the quality of the streaming of the video. Um, I know that Zoom, um, I think Teams, they're pretty good with that. 
However, Bongo, uh, just check with Bongo in case if you're using or you decide to use it in the classroom, um, it may have some issues with it. So make sure that it's streaming at high FPS rates. Now, another uh, point that I found could also be a good tip for anybody who's uh, using the whiteboard, just avoid lens flare on physical recording devices or my uh, glasses, I wear glasses, so I, I just try to keep it an angle which does not interfere with it. Um, these are subtle little things. I know that these are not, uh, if somebody is picky, then only then they notice, but it enhances the experience. And if you just do some bit of tweaking, it, it just makes it easier for your learners. Um, also leave recording equipment in place where it can not be uh, broken. So make sure that it's not uh, loose. Um, sometimes if it's um, your, your laptop is not fitting on the rostrum that you have because there's a big computer already there. Um, and when you turn from the whiteboard, it can also fall off. Check that both in person and online students are able to hear and understand the instructor. So that's something that you have to do. Uh, what you don't have to do is use light colored or thin markers on the whiteboard. Um, your students, your uh, students who are in the classroom, they might not have any issues with that. But the ones uh, to whom you're streaming, they might have issues. Uh, record all stream lectures in case of internet issue or for later upload. Uh, my guess is that since um, the assumption is that we're going to be on campus uh, meeting the students um, for maybe QA session or maybe just doing some tutorial or maybe just meeting them for one hour of your live lecture. So uh, if there's an internet issue, I mean, it's rare that it's going to happen in the classroom on campus. Uh, it may happen at home. Um, Thankfully, it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> but you just never know. Uh, but if it happens, um, you, uh, you you need to have a backup. So, for example, I always have that adapter that can be hardwired into my system. Uh, so that way, the Internet is uh, really much, much better than um, Wi-Fi. Um, the, the other thing that I thought about, I, I have not experienced this, this, this particular thing that much, but I think this may be an issue. Uh, that when instructors start walking around the teaching space, um, there will be some online students who won't be able to see you. But th there's another aspect to this. Uh, these are COVID times, so you shouldn't be walking around the space, teaching space anyway, or try to limit it as much as you can. Uh, set up all teaching material projected devices before the start of class. I think, Peter, all that you have to spend some time in. Uh, setting up the devices, it it, it takes time. Uh, place recording equipment not too close to the students because they are going to pick up noise. Uh, I think Chris mentioned this that the hanging mics they're picking up those noises and they can inter they could be interfering with, um, or maybe students they don't want their noise or their uh, conversations to be recorded. So it's a good idea to maybe just use lapel mic and maybe and I'll talk about another suggestion toward the end. Um, ensure proper lighting for you and the whiteboard. Uh, make sure that there's no glare on the whiteboard when you're writing stuff. You may not notice that, but students, they may, uh, who are you know, live streaming it. Uh, so it's a good idea to ask your TA to also give you live feed, live feedback. So it's a good idea, especially in the first few weeks of your teaching, uh, to have your TA come in if the TA can. Um, the other thing is sometimes you don't have a TA. In that case, maybe just ask one of your colleagues to come and help you out uh, in first few sessions. Uh, what kind of help? Just ask them to log into your classroom. Just make sure that what they're seeing on the screen is fine. They can hear you fine. Uh, kind of, you know, do this kind of testing with them. And also allow students to join online classes with a camera on. Uh, this is again important, but uh, I personally don't force my students to keep their cameras on. It's a good thing when they keep it on, but I don't force it because sometimes they're not comfortable and I don't force them. Uh, check questions from the stream as well as the class. Uh, that's again something that's important you can miss. So what I do with my uh, such sessions, I have 15 minutes. I, I know for, for a fact that after every 15 minutes, I'm going to pause and I'm going to check everything. So this is kind of my SOP, standard operating procedure that I've, I always follow. Um, and then do not leave stream or recording running after lecture or tutorial ends. It happened to me once. I was using Adobe Connect. Uh, my session ended at 9 p.m. Wednesday night. I was dead tired. I forgot to turn it off. 
So I came home, one of my students uh, sent me an email next morning uh, saying that you haven't uploaded the video yet. So I went back in and I couldn't find the link. The reason was that it was still recording and it was more than what 18 hours uh, of recording. So it was a pain to to edit it out and um, and, and to fix it. Um, also, um, this was a point that I wanted to make that repeat questions uh, that are asked by students so that people who are watching uh, remotely can also hear what the question was. So these uh, and again, this is some basic um, idea around how to go about uh, using whatever you have right now. I know a lot of you have already got a lot of experience with online teaching. So what I'm suggesting here is you don't have to like exert too much effort into designing a new course, uh, which is called hybrid course. Rather, I would say just use the same setup that you have, take it to the classroom if you can, uh, and, and just uh, be mindful that your time is also extremely important and also effectiveness. So this works. Uh, it has worked for me for many, many years. Um, there's um, new stuff coming up in terms of uh, what Zoom is now capable of doing. It was not capable of doing two years ago. So these things are improving. Uh, make use of them, uh, test them. Uh, I've also, like in engineering, um, I can tell you that there's uh, they're testing a cart. In fact, our, our department has already ordered a few. Uh, it's called AV card, audio video card, so which you can just take to the classroom. At the same time, uh, what Chris showed earlier uh, with the renovations in the classroom, um, our department is also going uh, into renovations, but it might not finish before uh, the start of the fall term. So um, with that, I would just end my screen share. And uh, okay. Yeah. OK, thanks so much, That's Umair. Nice. That was great. Um, 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 Daniel, maybe as your uh, set, are, do you have slides to share as well, Daniel? No? Oh, OK. Well, let's just uh, go right to Daniel, and then we'll, we'll get to the question. There's one question that's been posted, and we'll get to that after your presentation. Thanks, Daniel. Sure, sounds good. Yes, I'm slide free today. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Daniel Opperwall, and as Dina mentioned, uh, I am an online lear learning consultant at uh, Center for Extended Learning, but also have been and continue to uh, teach as an adjunct uh, at uh, Trinity College in the Faculty of Divinity over at UT. So I'm going to present a kind of a very different uh, angle on all this from, from the first three. One, I'm coming from a very much a humanities background uh, with courses focused on seminar interaction uh, and that sort of thing. And, and two, um, I am incredibly um, blown away and very jealous about some of the tech setups uh, because the way we had things set up um, at Trinity for the last for the years when we were we were doing these hybrid courses uh, was radically different. So hopefully that's helpful in a lot of ways uh, for some of you to to hear how it went in a much more stripped down uh, environment. So for me, um, this I, I'm speaking from uh, several classes I've done seminar based courses of my own as well as uh, with colleagues who I've worked with uh, over at Trinity to get theirs working. We're talking humanities courses, mostly graduate students, usually about 15 to 20 uh, in a class, and these are usually very seminar um, uh, focused courses. Uh, our tech setup, not even remotely like Chris Holt's amazing, amazing setup that I'm so envious of, where uh, we would go into the classroom with a laptop and a webcam and ideally an external mic and Zoom and uh, just kind of do our best. The down and dirty DIY method of teaching uh, uh, at the same uh, concurrently in class and online. Some of you at Waterloo may end up uh, in that type of a situation. Uh, not everybody's got Chris's uh, fantastic classroom or the others as well. So I just wanted to kind of share uh, as quickly as I can, just some pearls of wisdom, some broad takeaways uh, from some years of doing this. We started uh, teaching online courses in 2015 uh, at Trinity College out of well before COVID, but out of a need to expand uh, our, our student base. Uh, and we started off emphasizing these hybrid courses. We, we would try to run Zoom sessions uh, at the same time in the classroom. We actually got more and more away from that over the years to the point that we really don't do it at all anymore uh, because we started employing more and more and more asynchronous strategies. Uh, and it uh, leads me to my first point, my first question, which is number one, this is a lot to juggle if you've never done this before. So the first question I would ask is, do you need to do this at all? Is this, is this essential? In some cases you might 
you might feel like it is essential or it's definitely something you want to do. But if you feel like there are other approaches to your whole course that can take you away from running the concurrent session, you might want to consider those or you might want to consider a mix of running some maybe fewer concurrent sessions and trying to do some more things asynchronously or fully online as you can. Do you need to do it is a big question because it's going to be a lot to juggle. Uh, if you're going to go for it, you're diving in. That's you've probably made that decision anyway if you're already here. So if you're going to go forward and dive in, the number one thing I would say is get help with the technology in the classroom if you possibly can. Sorry, I've got little ones running around here. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, get help with the technology if you possibly can, especially for those first few weeks. Uh, I found it effectively impossible to lead a class if, uh, effectively while also trying to monitor what's going on with Zoom, little tech hangups, students messaging saying, help, I'm having trouble with this. If you possibly can get a TA or an OLA in there uh, or a colleague, if you can swap off back and forth with each other, I, hey, I'll help you out on Tuesday if, if you can come in, help me on Thursday. Whatever you need to do, if, if at all possible, get someone in the room to run the tech, especially in those first few weeks as you're getting used to it. If you've got that ready to go, uh, two key points about the tech, and these, these have already been made in other ways, but just to really reemphasize, the first three most important things in the classroom, the concurrent classroom, are audio, audio, and audio. We had constant issues with people not being able to hear either the instructor or other students, and it can be a sort of a small thing from a tech point of view that creates a huge thing a loss of an entire session sometimes for certain students just can't hear the audio. So make sure the audio is there above all. The second thing or sort of the fourth thing and my cute little list there is to make sure students can see your slides or anything else they need to see visually. Sometimes that can be accomplished if you have a good enough camera and a right, the right setup with just a projection behind you. And that's sort of a simple way of dealing with it. If you can't make that setup work, you might need to do some screen shares and some of the other things uh, that have been mentioned so far. So make sure you can be heard and the whole classroom can be heard. Chris's setup is, is spectacular. That's the ideal for the rest of us to take some tweaking, put the extra mic here, put it there. And sometimes it takes just kind of secondary strategies, repeating questions, repeating points, but making sure that this can be heard by the students who are remotely attending. So my next kind of overarching thing I want to leave you with is how much synchronous do you need to do and why? So I've already asked you, do you need to do it at all? And if you are going to dive in though, how much of it do you need and exactly why are you doing certain things synchronously? Think about that as you come into the planning process and try to identify the highest impact use of your in-class time. What's the most important to, thing to do synchronously? Uh, think about whether you can reduce some of that in-class time or at least reduce some of the pressure, if you will, on that in-class time time by maybe doing certain things asynchronously. Uh, do you need to lecture synchronously in class or is it going to work just as well to uh, have lecture content put up asynchronously and use that in-class time for something else? Uh, is in-class time the best space to attend to group work? De depending on the assignment, maybe it's a great space for that or maybe certain group types of assignments can be done asynchronously or in different sessions uh, at different times. So really identify exactly what it is you're looking to do synchronously with the, the concurrent setup and why. Uh, if you're going to have a seminar discussion, and this is this is a lot of what we did, as I said at Trinity, uh, make sure you prep yourself and the students much more than usual to get ready for that. Uh, how are the remote students going to fully participate in seminar discussion is the key question. We found it very, very difficult to just kind of walk in and try to have a normal conversation with with students being there on Zoom. Uh, this has been alluded to by the other presenters as well, but there is a, a really intense natural tendency to just look at the people who are physically there in front of you. And no matter how much you're conscious of it, it's very, very hard to give equal opportunity to the students who are remote, especially if the conversation really gets going and things are good. Uh, those students in the classroom can just get in quicker and you'll tend to gravitate towards looking at them. So you have to find strategies to to incorporate those remote students and you have to do it conscious consciously. One of the key things I would encourage if you're looking at discussions is see if you can use some asynchronous strategies to kind of prime the pump of the conversation before you get in there, especially with the remote students. Can you sort of seed some questions originally in say a discussion forum and get a little bit of a sense of what people are thinking before you come into the classroom? So you kind of know when someone has might have something to say about a certain point. Or could you use a, a tool we've been promoting uh, lately uh, called a Perusal, which is a, a 
a, a group a collective reading tool that allows students to read through text together, leave comments and questions as they go. Could be really uh, helpful to have gone through a peruse all exercise with your students before that synchronous session. So you once again, you know where the question points are, you know where some ideas already are. You can kind of call on people and manage the traffic that way. So get yourself ready asynchronously if you can and prime the pump. Have a plan for when and how to check in with the remote students. This has also already been alluded to. Uh, maybe it's every 15 minutes. I think Umera said that, but make sure you've got a strategy for saying once in a while I'm going to stop and make sure the remote students have a chance uh, to speak. And make sure you're monitoring the chat as well. Um, this can be really tricky. We often would find that students would make a comment in the chat and even a minute later, even two minutes later, it was hard to know what the context of that was, what exactly it was related to, and we kind of had lost the thread. Uh, so make sure you're monitoring the chat and encourage the students in the, who are using the chat to really broadly contextualize uh, what they're saying. I can remember some instances where uh, uh, people would say, oh, I, I disagree. And it, just 30 seconds later, you're like, I don't know what this is about anymore. And uh, maybe you can call on that student to, uh, to, to clarify, but it's these little amounts of time, these little pieces of getting um, uh, out of sync with each other can have a really big impact. So be ready to manage that. Read the chat, try to get as much context in there as you can and designate that time for online students to have a chance to speak. Uh, so I'm running out of my own time here, but the last thing, the big, big thing to uh, emphasize above everything else is be ready for things to go wrong and have a plan for what to do. Remember, if something goes wrong for some or all of the remote students, if Zoom just crashes or the Wi-Fi doesn't work, they still need to complete the activity. They still need to get through those learning materials. So creating alternative pathways and reducing the pressure, as I said, on the in-person session really has to, to it really helps a lot with that. Uh, I would definitely, definitely record the sessions. I'm not sure that Waterloo is going to require that 100%, but I highly encourage it so that you can post them later if someone drops off or if the whole class drops off, which can happen. Uh, and then think about if you're doing activities um, such as seminars, group work, whatever, think about what you're going to do to create an opportunity for students to participate in that if the technology couldn't work and they just couldn't uh, couldn't do it in, in the live session. Uh, so some broad things to leave you with. I don't want to be a wet blanket, but really overall, be ready for this to be tricky and challenging. Be ready to learn as you go. Uh, <clears throat> reach out for help early on and be ready to have a plan for, for what to do if uh, things don't go as smoothly as you'd hoped. Thanks very much, Daniel. That was uh, terrific. Th and thanks to all of the presenters. Um, we have a few more moments, so I'm going to go to the, uh, the chat for a moment and uh, just address the questions that have come up. So the first question was addressed to Chris. Um, Chris, how useful do you think it would be to have a TA or co-op student in the room throughout the class to monitor the remote students' help with technology? Sorry, Chris, did you want to, uh, to address that one? Uh, I'm on. Oop, I think okay. you're muted. OK, I was muted and I couldn't unmute again. I'm a Zoom's person, but I'm I guess I'm unmuted now, so I think I might have been shut off uh, earlier. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we didn't use TAs for that, but clearly that would be great, especially to monitor the chat and uh, watch for hands that might be raised. Um, but you know, we, we got through it. Um, without TAs in most cases. Great, thanks very much. I know, Daniel, you alluded to the importance of, uh, and, and Umer as well, uh, both of you had mentioned the importance of having either a TA or a student or even a colleague uh, assist you, especially in the early days. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything further to that. Yeah, that, that's right. So what we do at Management Sciences is pretty much this. So if somebody wants to you know, show their courses, what they've developed, uh, we just look at them and we have like weekly meetings and we just try and see what others are doing and if they have any questions. And that kind of helps. Uh, and I've done this personally for some of my colleagues. I would just go to their classes, making sure that their technical side is working well. They're not missing anything. Uh, TAs, having TAs is a really good idea, but in case if there are certain courses they do not qualify for getting a TA, the enrollment is low. So in those cases, don't be discouraged. I mean, you can ask any of your students to, to just tell you if everything is working well. Thanks, Sumer. 
Um, I'm going to skip down to a question here that was asked by Andrea. Um, equivalent opportunities for local and remote students to take part in the course activities was noted by Daniel. Wondering if others, um, and I'm assuming by others, you, you mean the presenters, have comments on this as well. So Chris and Umer and Peter, do you have anything um, you'd like to add to that? That's by the question. Um, equivalent opportunity for local and remote students to take part in the course activities was an important comment that Daniel made, trying to find those opportunities for students to take part, regardless of how they're uh, participating in the course, to, to, to actually be able to participate. And um, do you have any examples, perhaps, that you can tell us about or ways in which you try to ensure that there was equivalent participation? We occasionally, we had everybody in the room get on Zoom on their laptops. If you do that, then uh, make sure they're all on mute. You get a lot of feedback. Uh, but that allowed them to break out into groups and still be on an equal, sort of more equal plane. Yeah, I've had them do uh, similar things uh, to what you seem to be describing, Chris, uh, where we have some of the group in the classroom, some of them remote. Uh, and we have the people coming in from outside, you know, on a laptop to the group who are meeting inside the classroom. Uh, and we also often bring in project clients and people like that at the same time. Uh, and that seems to work quite well. But I, I think to me, the important thing here is that students are used to using these types of tools now. Uh, collaborate, collaborating on projects. Uh, using you know technology and the internet is something they're doing all the time, whether uh, outside the classroom. So it's not really a big change for them to do it inside. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm I'm just aware of the time here. Um, some of you may be able to stay on for a few more moments. Some of you may need to leave, and and that's perfectly fine. I did. Uh, Mary, did you want to mention anything about the the tip sheet? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to be called on, but yes. Oh, um... <laughs> I apologize, Mary. We are working on a tip sheet that we'll post up on the Keep Learning site. Um, sorry, I was outside where the church bells were ringing. Um, and, and actually, we're going to be gathering some of the tips from some of you guys that have come today. There are a few that we've missed, um, but yeah, we'll get that up on Keep Learning and we'll send it around to the participants as well once it's live. Um, but thank you guys all so much today for, for all your um, great ideas. It's great to hear all the different experiences. Um, and I think if we, we could still have more time for questions, I think if people want to stay a bit, wait, bit late later. Yep. Um, everybody's overwhelmed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Are there are there any other um, like I said, if you if you need to go, totally understand. But if there's any other questions that um, people can turn on their mics and and their video if they're comfortable. And um, there's a there's a question from uh, somebody in the chat. Yeah. Oh, there we go. From or Laura. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Laura says, can we find out what tech will be available in our rooms? Podiums, computers, webcams, etc. Um. I think it's more of a department, departmental thing. So every department might be different here. Um, so I would say just prepare yourself with the assumption that you are just going to be using your equipment. And uh, when you go in the classroom, and, and you should be comfortable using that equipment. Um, the other question here is about the bandwidth. And I, I just want to briefly address that. Um, if you had a large group in the class, bandwidth with everyone on video might be interesting. Now, this was a problem with Adobe Connect, but Zoom and these platforms are quite robust, so not a really big problem there. Andrea, did you want to speak a little bit to the tech available in the rooms? Yeah, I'll, I, I will just comment. So. Um, What's underway is uh, that the registrar's office is outfitting a total of 17 rooms uh, that um, are advertised to you 
their scheduling reps as as uh, fully equipped. So they're they're some of them were equipped for last fall, and they'll be 17 by the fall. And I know that we've been um, also just discussing with other faculties. Somebody mentioned the cart that was going to be available in engineering. Um, some of the the other faculties are, are, are coming up with different solutions, so they will no doubt be in contact with your schedule and your apps about what's available in their rooms as well. So uh, they're you'll be scheduled in if you're making the request um, for something that will be more like a hybrid class, but if you aren't in a room uh, that has any of the equipment, uh, I think um, we, can, we can try to help you out as much as possible with that, and there'll be information available on that as well. Thanks, Andrea. Um, Pendar has a question. Pendar, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes, can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, um, I was wondering if I could get the experience from the instructors here that um, since you're mentioning you were running things online as well as this kind of hybrid mode, what is the benefit for the students that are coming in in person versus the ones that are online. If we're making everything available online, why wouldn't they just being the whole th doing the whole thing online versus coming in in person and doing the more, you know, um, what we're used to in the in person teaching, especially with uh, engineering courses. So that's what I wanted to hear. Most of them choose to do it that way, in my experience, Penda. Yeah, I, I would I would say something similar, not not from the engineering, but um, for our courses, I, I maybe should have added this at the start. Uh, our setup was that you could you could do either either way, whatever you wanted, and come come in and out. Um, this is the post COVID. This fall is going to be a little different. Students are going to have to choose a stream, and they're going to have to stick with it. Uh, but we were doing true true high flex, you know, for the last few years in, in Toronto, where um, you know you could you could come this week online, and you could come next week in person. People tended to do just one or the other. Some people switched back and forth just a little bit. But it really was just about personal preference in the end. Some students love being online; they thrive, uh, they love it. And uh, those students that that's kind of what they did, even if they were local. Certainly, if they were across the country. Uh, but then a lot of students, you know, for for whatever reasons, they they just feel more connected. They just feel that they can learn more if they're in person, even if in theory there's they don't have to be. They just want to be, and so this opens up that opportunity for them to get wet. For them, is a better experience for all kinds of, you know, hard to describe reasons. And I, to me, it was just really just that simple. I think. Could I follow up with a short question or no? Uh, so did any of you follow up with the students to ask whether on the same course uh, the person who was who was coming in versus the person who was taking the course online, how their experiences differed on the same course? We I, we didn't do a formalized survey at Conrad, but uh, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that in our particular domain, the students vastly wanted to be in the classroom um, because um, it's a very you know interactive, um, you know, um, Socratic uh, style that we use and, and uh, online didn't really work for them. Thank you. OK, I'm, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions in the in the in the chat. Um, are there and, and I don't see any other um, hands raised to ask questions? Um, Maybe, so, maybe yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, uh, Umer mentioned a great point that you shouldn't be wandering in a COVID environment. So uh, stick in front of your camera. We also had, you know, a slightly, you know, it was a constrained area that we marked on the floor with tape. Uh, that might be a way of getting, um, you know, being able to wander a little bit and still staying because nothing is more alienating for the offsite students, it seemed than you walking off screen and then continuing a conversation that they felt like they weren't privy to. Um, so it was important to always be accessible on that camera and tape on the floor helped us to do that. Uh, that's a great tip. Thanks, Chris. Um, actually, there there is a couple of questions now that have come into the chat. So uh, one was from Brandon. He says, um, how would you do a flip a flipped classroom with a hybrid mode and does it make it harder or easier? Um, 
Uh, I think that you can pretty much do that. It's it's not a difficult thing to not do it. Um, I think it would be easier. That's my personal uh, thinking because I'm very comfortable doing things online. And uh, for example, I teach a course uh, to executive level students who are like directors in different companies or senior executives. And when I'm talking to them, that's pretty much what we are doing. So it's all online. Um, they all come with their cameras on. It's a smaller classroom. Uh, we do activities together. They come up with discussion. We just I just introduce a topic and then it's just discussion based on um, the literature that we want to bring to the class and all that. So I think it's very much doable. Even if you're teaching a STEM course with um, where you have to do some equation solving and all that. Yeah, yeah my I, I would course, encourage. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Peter. You go ahead. I, I was just going to say my courses are pretty much flipped uh, yeah. online, and and it works well. Uh, I I think the the capabilities that are there to be able to present the subject knowledge uh, online are greater uh, uh, than they used to be. It's very easy for people to do that, uh, but also it's very easy for them to work in groups online. I think one of the things that isn't that widely understood yet is that online group working can work really, really well and has some advantages over the classroom, particularly asynchronous communication. So at the moment, I have groups with people in India, China and Canada, I guess, are the main countries. There are others, Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. Uh, and they're all working really well. And uh, and that's the way it's been for years. So uh, so yeah, I, I think there, you can almost do it better online, I would say. That's controversial probably and not measured, but I do think that uh, you know there, there are big advantages in as the use of asynchronous uh, group activity online. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's not not only workable, but it's something I would highly encourage to, to start there to think of your if you're going to do this um, the concurrent stuff, think of it as a hybrid classroom and design up from something that's going to work fundamentally online uh, and, and adding those synchronous elements that way, rather than thinking I start with the classroom and then I try to figure out how the remote students are going to get wedged in there. See if you can think of it the other direction. Um, and you know, one of the things that this can help address if you're doing something more of a hybrid is these little things that become big things that Umer mentioned, for example, shoot, I forgot I forgot to turn the camera on today. I just lost an entire lecture for you know the online students or whatever, um, and uh, or I didn't record it. And now I got to go sit in my office, and this has happened to me too. <laughs> or you know, we left it on for the whole time, and now you have this huge file. And if you've if if you've put things made them asynchronous or fully online that are going to work in that format already, it's just that much less pressure every time you walk into the classroom. It's that much less cognitive load, um, and it's that that many fewer things can go wrong and those pathways for the online students become more natural. So it, it's a great idea to think of it as a hybrid. Dina, can I can I add something here? Yes, sure. Uh, so I, I just want to mention one more thing here. Um, our preparation is very much focused on how we deliver lectures. Um, I would say it's going to be extremely challenging with the hybrid teaching when we go. Some students are on campus, some students are not on campus to do all the assessments. So there will be quizzes, there will be assessments, there will be exams, there will be class participation. So think about think about those aspects equally. Uh, this is one just one element that you have to just go in front of the class, deliver the lecture, that's all good. But then there's gonna be another big you know, animal to take care of. Uh, it's, it's about just uh, you know, uh, making sure that you're ensuring a level playing field for everyone for the students who are not in the classroom and for the students who are in the classroom. Thanks, Umair. Um, there, I, I see another, there was another question from Mary. I'm not sure if it was answered though. In all the registrar classrooms, is it possible for the audio to go to the classroom and remote? Was, was that answered for you, Mary, or? I don't think so, or I don't know. Um, yeah. Sorry, okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if the if the comment below it was was responding to it, but maybe not. I don't know. So so Mary, um, in those 17 rooms, absolutely 
the audio will be be hooked up so that it can go remote. In the other rooms, um, I think it's a little bit more complicated. So uh, I think you would want to just check if you wanted to do it in another room, how that might be facilitated. So again, the, the 17 rooms that are going to be set up as um, as uh, um, lecture capture whatever we're calling those rooms now um, that will be already set up in advance so that that your audio will be projected to the remote audience so in another room it the automatic default would be it would be projected to your local room so whether or not we can actually hook things up so that it could be projected to the to the remote audience is uh, is another question so just make sure you check what room you're in and how it's outfitted and then contact us if you need help. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Andrea. Um, okay, I think uh, I think maybe we should end it there. I'm not seeing any further questions or hands up and uh, we have gone 15 minutes over time. Very much appreciate that the speakers have stayed on with us um uh to to answer further questions this has been fantastic thank you so much for sharing your experiences um someone did ask if the slides would be sent um brianna correct me if i'm wrong but this this recording will be posted on the uh keep learning website under recorded events so when you go to the yeah. keep learning website you see upcoming events and you see recorded events so um the event will be posted and you can access all of the slides that way. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that would suffice if, if um, it, uh, the only other thing I can think of is, is if we um, would, would uh, collect the slides themselves from the instructors and then we could post that with the recording. Perhaps we could do that. Yeah, we can either do that or we can share them with all the participants. But if, if the participants are, or if the, the panelists are happy to share, we can get them to people, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can send them out in an email with the recording once it's available, hopefully oh, later this week. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Awesome. Have a great Sounds afternoon, great. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks once again, Umer and Peter and Chris and Daniel. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.